this is kind of the, the wilderness view that you're going to have. Get me into the picture. Ta-da! But uh, the reservoir, kind of the landscape of it. It's really calm here right now, so it's a pretty good time to be filming. So I won't get a lot of people complaining. It's too windy. But it's not. So uh, hopefully, hopefully, there won't be a lot of traffic. There's a road right here, but there is some traffic you're going to hear going by. But we're filming in the middle of the week, in the middle of a day. And uh, it's pretty nice, actually. In fact, it's gorgeous. Um, a couple of things right off the beginning there's a couple current missing people cases that I'm going to talk to you about that uh, deserve attention and the first one is in uh, Maine so people can know about it and this is what it says the search for a 62 year old Lowell Wheaton a missing fisherman from Old Town has entered its second week as multiple agencies continue to scour Pacoop Pocumcus Lake, P-O-C-U-M-C-U-S, and its surrounding areas. Wheaton was last in contact with his family on April 27th when he was on his way to camp at the lake, according to a release from the Maine, Maine Warden Service. The following day, a drifting canoe with an attached outboard motor was discovered on the lake, prompting a search operation. Maine Warden Service, Maine Forest Service, Game wardens, Maine State Police, and others. Since then, officials have been searching the lake and surrounding shorelines and roads, and they haven't found them. After completing an extensive search with divers and sonar for a week, we have covered the most likely areas and now have switched to flights over the lake. Periodic searches, said the Maine Warden Service. In addition to the warden searches, game wardens have been investigating the area of camps, roads, and any signs of Wheaton. The lake spans five miles long and one mile wide, maximum depth of 44 feet and is part of the West Grand Lakes areas. Shane Oliver, who owns a camp on Bottle Lake, a neighboring lake that leads into West Grand Lake watershed, expressed concern about the dangers of boating during this time of the year. He emphasized the risk posed by cold water temperatures. The ice has been gone maybe three weeks. Water is very cold. You'd survive about 10 minutes. So this lake, Hungry Horse, it had ice on it, but it didn't cover the complete lake. This lake's pretty deep, and it goes back 20 miles. It's a very, very long lake. So, quite a difference there. Now, the man that's missing, Lowell Wheaton. There's a picture of Lowell. And this search is still going on, so if you're in that area, you know, uh, walk the shores, give the main warden service some hand, some help. If you have a plane flying over the lake, would help. Very sad, very, very sad. And then we also have another ongoing case. This one is even more recent. It involves a man named John Early, and he's missing just out of uh, an area east of Ashland, Oregon. It's a picture of John. John went missing April 30th this year, about 4 p.m. He was mushroom picking with a friend, and they were in the Jenny Creek Highway 66 area of Douglas County, about two miles southeast to Howard Prairie Lake. Uh, they got the California Regional uh, SAR Task Force, Josephine County, Siskiyou County, and Klamath County search and rescues. They were on ATVs, canines, and mounted units. And uh, John has not been found, which is unusual. But mushroom pickers have a habit of disappearing. We've talked about this. Now, in John's case, he's been missing since April 30th, but they're still searching. And they actually asked for help from Southern Oregers, Oregonians and Northern Californians to get in there and help with the search. So if you know anybody or you live in that area, 
I'm going to give you, show you a map where this is happening at. So, the California border is about in this area right here. This is the Jenny Creek Road. This is Ashland, Oregon right here. Highway 5 coming up from California. I know this area very well. Lots of strange things happen there. So, lots of strange things. And a lot of sightings of strange things. A lot of disappearances. That area just north of Ashland, up on Medford, up near uh, Crater Lake National Park. Lots of disappearances. So, if you can get in there to search, that Jenny Creek Road area goes along and follows Jenny Creek, which is uh, lots of water in it this time of year, but not enough to wash somebody away. Now, one thing I want to talk about this time of the year, and I just have a bug crawling on my neck, and I am aware of this, is during May, the ticks are in abundance. And I mean abundance. Uh, last year, we were out, Angie and I were out with a friend, and we're on the North Fork Road up to the, near the northern part of Glacier National Park. And we got out and we were walking around, and we were taking a trail off into this area. We came back and the friend we were with got warm and took his shirt, took his like his overtop off like I'm wearing. He had like five ticks on his shirt under his major, under his pullover. And then he took that shirt off and he had four or five more ticks under that shirt. So we all stripped down and everybody had ticks on them. Everybody. And this guy's lived in Montana for 50 years and he said he's never had one tick before and he can't believe it. So it doesn't matter where you're at. You come out from the woods, you should look for ticks. And there's a proper way and an improper way to take ticks off. Go to the uh, internet and read about how you properly take a tick off. There's actually devices sold in outdoor stores. They're about that long. And they teach you how to take the tick off from its root. It's very important. So, John Early, missing, 65 years old the area east of Ashland, okay? Now we've got some pretty interesting letters. We're gonna go with them. Hey Dave, I've been thinking about your missing persons project. With all due respect, the issue is so big that you have a scant chance to solve it, even partially. Let me stop right there. <laughs> you think I'm gonna give up because this Yoho says that? And has this person watched any of our documentaries? It is that why I suggest you involve people more able to give the issue a solution. Oh, I guess I can't. And I guess my team can't. Does this person know who I work with? I suggest you involve military intelligence or similar people who have the ability to get behind the problem sufficiently with sufficiently deep pockets. Is that why the military is so open to helping? think I, I'm going to go to them and say, hey, can you help me? You think they're going to help me? You think that they're going to share information? No. <clears throat> Who should have the motivation to seek a solution to the problem on the account of being among the victims? They lost a B-52 plus tripulation after all. Take into account that you have counted 1,600 victims in only part of the U.S. and Canada and 16 other countries. This person hasn't read my books. This is 5% of the world's population. What? That is 5% of the world's population? That's what he said. If you look at the statistics of what is published, they suggest that there are more than one enemy actors for the U.S. alone. Looking at the MO also, multiple actors are suggested one per MO. I'm going to be polite. I'm going to take a deep breath. When I get these comments from people that maybe have watched a couple of my videos and they think it's just easy peasy to solve or they think I'm an idiot or they think the people I work with are idiots or they haven't taken the time to watch a documentary I don't know as I've stated before it gets me pretty frustrated next one hey Dave I'm listening to Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell and that was years ago Art has since died 
the other day and heard something that made me think of you and Missing 411. The episode was the Ghost to Ghost show that aired on 10-28-94, October 28th, 94. The segment I'm referring to was around three hours and 18 minutes in. The caller's name was also Dave, and he spoke about an experience that happened to him off the ground on a cliff in the wilderness. The grizzly bears are out. There's nobody around. I got my head on a swivel. The caller reportedly moved distances with no recollection, including across water. The caller informed an indigenous tribal member about what happened, and they explained it was what is called a wind river turnaround. This is an event where the person is stripped of memory and transported distances. The caller also reported of being on an ancient Shoshone burial ground. I don't know if you can do anything with this info and you probably have heard of it before, given the date of the airing, but I just thought I could help. Thanks for looking into these stories. There's a lot of Native American people out there that are watching. They know I, I respect their traditions and their heritage. If any of them out there know about this, please let me know. Please let us know. Make a comment on the video. I'd appreciate it. Here comes a car. I'll let it pass before I go on. Okay, next one. Hey Dave, the bone, so a couple videos ago, I, I showed you a picture of a bone I actually caught in a river around here fishing. Very strange, it's never happened to me before. It said the bone could possibly be a Pleistocene Ice Age megafauna washed out of a bank of the river. They often collect on sand and gravel bars and I've also caught bones while fishing, probably due to them being light and a hook can be set into them. Extinct native horse, bison, maybe. Riverbanks and sedimentary layers can preserve bones up to thousands of years old. I'm no expert, but do collect old bones that come out of our local Texas river near my house. I've recently found a bison skull cap with other bones, which I believe washed out due to the spring rains. Attached, uh, also a screenshot of a fossil forum that I'm aware of on the rivers. P.S. The bison skull and bones was found on the same river bottom where your wood duck mount was harvested. Oh, this person sent me that wood duck mount. I remember that. Thank you. So, the bottom line on the bone. I had a series of taxidermists, physicians, uh, chiropractors, and other medical professionals chime in. And the general thought was, is it's a femur bone of a bear. I had a couple of uh, taxidermists confirm, and they showed me some other pictures, and that's what it looks like. It's that thick, short femur bone of a bear. Makes sense. And since we do have a lot of bears out here, that also makes sense. Some other people said, oh, it's a pig bone. And one problem, I don't have any pigs around here. Okay, next letter. Hey Dave, Chris here from Ontario, Canada. I've been interested in a rash of strange sounds that have started to become a worldwide epidemic. Sometimes they were reported as booms or sometimes very loud trumpet sound as well. These events have occurred regularly in British Columbia and Saskatchewan particularly. I know that my theory may be out there, but I think there are events that are described in the book of Revelations. Let me turn a bit here and give you a slightly different view here. Could it be that extraterrestrials have a part in ushering in their existence and quite possibly the true existence of God? That's for a little Canadian like me to understand, laughing out loud. It's no worthy to mention I'm curious as to any possible missing cases correlating to these and other paranormal issues. Uh, no. No. But I will tell you something that's kind of cool. Is we don't see a lot of bees these days. But just in the last hour that I've been here setting up and working, I found and seen some great bees. Bees. 
There's one right there. He just flew away. Beautiful colors on him. Beautiful colors. Beautiful colors. Next letter. Hey Dave, I have a quick note to let you know I really enjoy your YouTube channel. I also purchased Missing 411 The UFO Connection and I've watched it several times. So what I'm hearing over here, and you might hear it too, it's either a woodpecker or something way up there is hammering on something. I can barely hear it. Maybe you can hear it too. I also have a dog named Hawk. Well, that's, a, that's interesting. That has been with me for many years, a loved member of our family. I wasn't aware of this email address until tonight watching your show. The last time I used it, blah, blah, blah. Not sure if that went your way or not. As I mentioned, I'm retired law enforcement, doing most of my work in Texas. Anyway, please keep up the great work. You are appreciated. Thank you. And I'll, I don't know if, and the reason I read that is that uh, I get a lot of email from law enforcement. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for chiming in. I appreciate your point of view and appreciate your service because right now it's a hell zone out there and the people that are still on the front lines, you are appreciated and you are loved. And I know the villagers care. So thank you. Next one. Hey Dave, love the videos. I watched all the Bigfoot classes and thoroughly enjoyed them. I <laughs> should make a comment about that. Oh boy. You know, you try to do something good. Try to keep the momentum going on the Bigfoot class. I have had 10 people send in checks that were not signed, that were not dated, or they were not filled out correctly, and the bank wouldn't take them. You know what a colossal headache that is over a $10 check. So we have to get out an envelope. We have to pay for the envelope. We have to pay for the stamp. We have to pay for our staff to sit there and write it out and send it back. Huge issue, huge issue. And just over trying to do something nice for you guys. Some people need to pay attention. Oh, and the worst one, somebody sent in a, the completed test in an envelope, no check, a return envelope. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. Okay, onward. Love the videos, watch the Bigfoot classes, and thoroughly enjoyed them, especially the DNA information. I've been waiting for evidence like this to finally surface. Well done. It is so sad that this evidence is not getting more publicity. Why isn't it getting more publicity? Because there's a group of people that have decided to fight us tooth and nail on this. There's no rationale. And they could and they could go on and do their own test. But they won't. They just decide that they want to argue with us. And as I've stated many times before, that could you please move on? We're, we're, we're recording right now, thank you. <laughs> the loudest truck in the valley drives by and stops right here. Oh boy. Okay, and I'm gonna go on. I could go on and on and on about the Bigfoot topic, but in the nutshell, I've always believed it was proven to be true. It would be either, now he decides to stop down the road. Oh. It would either be an animal, ape, or human. And the historical and DNA evidence is solid showing this is a human. I'm also retired from law enforcement, Deputy Sheriff, October 2020. Thank you for your service. I don't know what this guy's doing. I have no idea. Hopefully he'll move on. Now, I had originally first contacted you by YouTube and was hoping I could get a hold of a video footage of one of my relatives had a UFO he recorded and shared on Facebook. Sadly, he does not have it anymore. It was some amazing footage that I was shocked to keep and lost it. I was also amazed that hardly anyone had anything to say about what he recorded. 
It was like crickets. I did ask him and his wife to detail the events so I could share it with you. I told them I was going to share this information with you and gave them your YouTube information so they could learn more about. They were excited about me sharing what they saw and recorded and said it would be okay. His name is Gregor. Gregor is married to my wife's cousin and has a small farm. He's a solid Christian man and also visits the local county <laughs> and also visits the local county jail in Rowan County as a chaplain. Gregor said an event happened. It happened. So there's about 100 miles of shoreline here. And this guy decides he wants to park right here and keep his engine running. Oh, oh I have something to say. And yeah, the location was at their house in Salisbury, North Carolina. Late evening after sunset, weather was clear, not near any water, and the UFO was traveling southwest to northeast. They could not make out any details about it, but only said it was a light. Gregor first thought it was a plane, then it took off in a different direction in a way the plane could not. I actually did see Gregor's recording and it was strange. It was right above them. The sky was not totally dark. It definitely was a real object and the way it maneuvered was quick. I remembered it moving to the side and there was no plane. They also said that several years ago, the same location, same time of day, they saw a cluster of three orange objects that moved slowly from the same direction. Both Gregor and his wife Kathy saw it. At first they thought it was satellites and the sun setting could be recording of them. Well, hallelujah. I thought he was going to sit there and just burn the whole tank of fuel. They later, re they later realized there were no satellites that flew over the area at that time of night. Gregor searched the internet and found out the same things. Orange lights had been photographed at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. His wife stated they have flown in our area after leaving Myrtle Beach. Dave, I know these people and they would never conjure up anything like this. If they say they saw it, it really happened. I hope that this information can be added to other evidence. It just has been. We just added it. Thank you for that. Next one. Hey, Dave. I hesitated emailing after the email mix-up of a rocket launch. I don't know what that means. When I heard the story of the person in school getting hit in the forehead, I had to write. It happened to me also. So the other day, uh, I gave you a story where somebody was hit right between the eyes, right near the pineal gland. About five years ago, I was getting into bed as always. I turned out the light, swung my legs up onto the bed, and before my head hit the pillow, I saw, coming from the top of my bedroom door, this is why I've never told this before, a miniature spaceship coming at me. It was about three to four inches wide with a clear bubble on top. It was gunmetal black, and the bottom part of the saucer was angular. It looked like the things that were in the Batman movie that he throws from his belt. I watched this thing fly at me, just like the person in the letter. I felt the impact. Same pace, lower forehead. Weirder yet, I just laid back and went to sleep. In the morning, I remembered it, and I couldn't believe that I just went right to sleep after it hit me. I could still feel the impact from it, no marks. This happened right before Bigfoot activity started at my home. Thanks so much for listening. It helps to have a place to go with these stories. Yeah, <laughs> that is, as I stated when I heard the first time, I've never heard of anything like this before. This is odd to say the least. So regarding Robert Hagstrom, who I said that that was a monumental story, couple of videos back I really wish people would go back and watch that if you haven't seen it because all the pieces of the puzzle come together Dave I found that people don't care until it happens to them they pay no attention to the news and what is changing around them until it's too late look at the riots we've had in our nation in the last few years people acted like it came out of the blue and there was no warning on the destruction and the falling upon them you are trying to warn the masses but only a remnant will hear what you are saying Thanks for speaking out. As an old man, I fear for what's coming in our children and grandchildren. Well, thanks for appreciating what I'm trying to do. Hey Dave, to begin, my deepest sympathies with regard to your son. I'm a longtime educator in one of the largest public schools in the country. 
And I predicted very early on the negative impact that the shutdown would cause young people where it could continue for an extended period of time. But I was wrong. It was actually much worse than I imagined. I see it every day. And I know that you must blame it, at least in part, for what happened to your son. Whenever a parent of which I am loses a son or daughter, the question that continually haunts them is, was there anything else I could have done to prevent it? It is an unfair question because no matter what you did, you were still constantly asked it. For whatever little consultation it brings, I've listened to you in all of your videos and I can honestly say that you're one hell of a father. Sometimes no matter what we do, things seem, oh my God, is this guy back? Different truck, same sound. <laughs> okay. For whatever little consultation it brings, I've listened to you in all of your videos and I can honestly say you're one hell of a father. Sometimes no matter what we do, things seem destined to happen. And we have to accept that not everything is in our power to control them. The pain never fully goes away and I can tell you from your letters that you have helped many others probably save many lives. Lives. Clearly, your public service to the community continues despite retiring as a policeman. Let me say, let me say this. In all of this, if I just helped one person, that would be my blessing. I've had a lot of people write to me and say that just talking about mental health, talking about the pain, talking about fighting the fight, talking about never giving up. This is important, folks. Really important. You can't. Now onto the missing person phenomenon. I read most of your books over the years. I viewed most of your videos and on all of your movies. Well, thank you. You are an educated villager. In other words, I'm very familiar with your profile points. And I've long ago ruled out the usual culprits and explanations that you've been repeatedly bombarded with over the years, such as serial killers, Bigfoot, wild animals, runaways, etc. When trying to piece together common links over a decade or so, I first heard George Knapp interview you in Coast to Coast. I have contemplated long and hard over those years on two fundamental issues that this mystery raises and would love to hear your thoughts on them. So, this is one reason why I do this right here. I want you to understand that I try not to keep anything off, off the table. I'll discuss everything, which is another reason why I make myself available at conferences and things to talk about this stuff. I see a little boat on the lake, very strange. First is, of course, what happened to the missing people? The details of so many of the cases strongly suggest that they are taken somewhere else. How, where? Another world, dimension, or ship? The answers to these questions remain complete speculation. We can only guess, but it would help explain many of the anomalies that frequently occur in missing 411 cases, like the body being found in places that have previously been searched. Likewise, it would explain how a person or a body could be found in an impossible distance away from he or she disappeared, especially given the person's age or physical condition. How could they have traversed impossibly rough terrain in that time frame of their disappearance? How could they often not show any signs of exposure, dehydration, malnourishment, after having been missing for days in cold and wet conditions? Not unless they were not there. ka -ching. Bang, hit the drum. On the how, you've brought up portals, and that certainly is a possibility. I can imagine other out-of-the-box ideas too, but they too lack any hard evidence to come to any firm conclusions. Some of my wild ideas, equally if not more substantiated, unsubstantiated, include the possibility of other entities abducting people. Did this person watch Missing 411, the UFO connection? be they from inner earth or in a cloaked advanced aerial vehicles. Perhaps there is a leak between animal mutilations and human disappearances. Missing 411, the UFO connection, they said it. Perhaps they have the technology to alter time, so what seemed like they were right there may not have occurred as instantaneously as others perceived. So I gotta tell you, 
There's a little boat out there. Very odd to see a boat on this lake this time of the year. Very odd. This, is, this lake is very isolated and desolate. If your boat broke down out there, nobody's coming for you. There's nobody else on the lake, I doubt, for 20 miles. Now, he's not fishing, so I don't know what he's doing. But Anyhow, they were right there. It may not have occurred as simultaneously as they thought. However, there have been eyewitnesses to cattle being beamed up into a UFO. Really? I've never found one credible witness to that. Whereas there are no known eyewitness accounts of that existing and missing people being beamed up to a UFO, to the best of my knowledge. So once again, the deeper you consider the idea, the more holes you discover in the theory. Secondly, there's a question of motive. Why would these people, especially those profile groups that you have highlighted, be taken? I believe there must be a connection between why people are taken and who goes missing. I don't believe it is totally random. Neither do I. Why do people of German ancestry, super fit, or academically accomplished or disabled handicapped people, for instance, have in common? I would argue nothing. Perhaps it is instead different groups of being targeted for entirely different reasons. Okay. So I've said this before, but I'll throw it out there again. What if somebody is monitoring our DNA? What if they're monitoring and trying to understand how they can alter DNA to make us more resistant to these diseases or handicap issues, or et cetera. Just what if? Perhaps it is instead of different groups being targeted for different reasons, just like a farmer grows crops. different purposes like corn to feed his livestock or to make breakfast cereals or cotton tobacco like we do not eat at all maybe different types of people are taken for entirely different reasons I'm going to go now go far out on a limb of my own speculation I claim no knowledge and evidence to the validity of the following ideas but just to open the topic conversation to consider other possibilities I'm far from certain in believing them to be true to myself I always love this when I get these things. These ideas tie to the UFO field. They're hardly controversial and far from universally accepted by ufologists. But what if some of them are true? If it could explain a lot. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with these claims, so I'll bullet point them and shorten this. German Nazis in a secret space program that continued after World War II. Could their racist ideology be the reason to prioritize people of German stock? Secret space program. I won't say anything. Scientists and other promising young scholars and students, does this or some other SSP require new specialists or recruits to simply be taken? Perhaps if they refuse, they are then returned deceased and never to be found. What if that journey of going and coming, they just don't survive it? Remember in Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty. What if that transporter system going back and forth, there's a glitch? Maybe there's an electrical storm. I don't know. If the abductors possess time travel or time altering technology, maybe they take very young people who they have foreknowledge of being productive in some future program once they reach adulthood. Or perhaps they have been identified to have right traits unknown to us that makes them qualified for whatever program or role. Disabled people or those with declining health. This is a horrific theory but perhaps they're seen as some entities as disposable and targeted as food for experimentation. This idea I would compare to that of some crime thriller where prostitutes have targeted victims because they won't attract as much attention as more well-established members of the community. Hear that thump, thump, thump? Can you guys hear that? Just stopped. 
And, you know, I like my theory better. That another group much smarter, more advanced than us has the ability to alter DNA, make us more resistant, etc. And maybe that's why people are taken that have these disabilities. I see that I'm already over my thousand words, so I'll wrap this up. None of what I am, uh, none of what I have mentioned above is close to certain and maybe even outlandish. However, I am convinced that the true answers, the true answers, hold on a sec here. Yes, the true answers. These questions are in fact beyond our usual norms of thinking and understanding. To truly get to the truth, I believe will require something of a revolution of scientific knowledge and or disclosure. Thanks for taking time to read this and I wish you and your loved ones the best. See, I really like those kind of posts, uh, emails. I appreciate you sending those in. And people that send in things like that that are well thought out, that are true possibilities, and I give it true possibilities, it makes the audience think. I sit in bed a lot at times and try to wonder what the heck is going on in our world? Because I don't think it's as easy as the scientific community wants you to think it is, in my humble opinion. Okay, the next case. Very confusing case. Very confusing. Involves another Oregon case. And this is weird because I don't usually do back-to-back -back state cases, but the first one we talked about regarding John, John Early. Oregon, Southern Oregon, way Southern Oregon. This one is in Northeast Oregon in the Wallowa W-A-L-L-O-W-A -L -L -O -W -A Mountains. Ray Barber, 22 years old, went missing November 26, 1965. He was elk hunting with a friend named Jim Broussard. Now, Ray was a super smart young man. He was a research chemist working for Oregon State's Research Institute in their radiation department. He's also a dedicated outdoorsman, Loved to hunt, loved to fish. Well, right before Thanksgiving in 1965, he left his home where he was living with his mom and dad and left for Willowa where he met, where he was gonna meet Jim. Well, they established the camp on November 24th. They hunted Thanksgiving day, no issues. If you've ever watched Missing 411, and Missing 411 is our first movie, and that had to do with a series of young people that disappeared. And one of the stories, probably the most astonishing story, occurred not far from the Willowa Mountains. And it involved a young boy who disappeared, and uh, we tried to recreate that with Les Stroud's Survivor Man. And you can watch it on Amazon right now. And I would suggest if you haven't seen it, go watch it. Because this area of Oregon is weird. That's all I'll say. So anyhow, they hunted Thanksgiving Day. And then the following day, Friday, November 26th, the guys decided to hunt separately. And hold your taters for a second. Anytime people separate, bad things happen, I'm telling you. I know hunters like to hunt separately. So if you're going to hunt separately, you're going to hunt alone, and you're going to hunt off trail if you're a hunter, what do you do? You plan. And you get a personal locator beacon. I've told you before, if you break your leg and you're off trail, chances are you're never going to be found and you're going to die there. Because I have broken my leg. Bro I broke both, both legs at different times in my life. 
One time I was able to walk out, the other time I broke my tibia and fibula. There's no way I was going anywhere. It was the greatest pain in my life. So, personal locator beacon. People always say, well, Dave, uh, what's the best type? They all work. They all work. Just get one, and you don't need one that needs a monthly fee. This is important. So they hunted separately, and they agreed to meet back at their camp uh, at dusk. So Jim responds back to the camp, gets there before dark, and Ray doesn't arrive. So Jim fired off a few shots, honked the horn on their car, walked a bit out on the trail, couldn't find Ray, didn't hear any shots in return. So he got in his tent and he thought, well, he'll be back in the, either late tonight or tomorrow morning. And he got in his bag. Well, that night it started to snow and, this, and the temperature started to drop a huge amount. Well, the next day, Jim contacted the Union County Sheriff's Office in Oregon. High winds started to occur later that day. Union County contacted a couple people they knew with airplanes and they put them up. And then they also got a series of ranchers that were in the area to get on their horses and hike the trails that they thought that Ray would be on. And they also made a formal request for helicopters from the state and the feds. Now what was happening at this point is almost like a paper cut, cookie cutter type replication of every disappearance involving a hunter. And that is it, the weather continued to deteriorate. Snow continued to fall. The obstacles for the searchers got huge. Another car, hold on. So what happened was, is it got so cold with wind chill, that they only had searchers on horseback and when the wind wasn't blowing and the weather was okay, they put more planes up. And then November 28th till December 2nd, ranchers, outfitters, hunters, the US Forest Service, the Union County Sheriffs all decided to go out no matter what, because they, they were gonna try to save a life. On December 2nd, one group of searchers were on top of a ridge a wind-blown ridge, which implied to me that those tracks couldn't have been there long, but they found some tracks. And they said they looked like human tracks that went to the end of the ridge. And their belief was that these were raised tracks. And their belief was as he walked off the edge of this 100-foot cliff. And temperatures were well below zero. It was late in the day. And they said, hey, we're gonna to have to ride back and we'll pick it up the next day at the bottom of the, the mountain. So the next day they had a couple hour ride out to the bottom of this mountain. And at the bottom, they found drag marks. And three miles from the bottom of the cliff, three miles, they found Ray's body. I said, drag marks. The press release by the sheriff said, Ray drug himself three miles. That's what it said. He drug himself three miles. Now reports were that the body was, quote, battered. That's an interesting word to use. First reports coming out said, oh, and they also said that he had a severe head injury and it was bleeding a lot when they got to him. He was dead. But they thought he accidentally shot himself. Well, then they looked at the gun he had. He had a rifle. And the barrel on the rifle had exploded at the end. And the theory was, is that he fell down the cliff. He got some dirt in the end of the barrel was gonna shoot off a few rounds to sit, tell people that he needed assistance when he shot out around the barrel of the gun blew up. A 
Other reports come, came out at the beginning that he was murdered. That's an interesting theory, considering he's out when nobody else would be out. So they put Ray's body on a horse, and they rode it down, and they put it in an ambulance, and they took the body into a place called LaGrange, Oregon. LaGrand, Oregon, LaGrand. Now here's the part that really gets Dave mad. The newspaper said that there was a medical exam. This is, this is important wording. Uh, they gave Ray a medical exam and the thought was he died of exposure. Hmm. Well then, this is back in the day when they actually had investigative reporters. And a reporter asked, well, does that mean you did an autopsy? That, that statement was ignored for a couple weeks. Then, some pushy reporter asked, where's the autopsy result? We want to read it. Then it came out, they didn't do an autopsy. Hmm. No autopsy. Coroner stated that it wasn't needed. And then he stated it's, it wasn't requested by the sheriff. But the Union County Sheriff said, no, I did request that you do an autopsy. Because the body was battered. And he had a head injury. And yeah, that, that could be contributed, attributed to the fall. But still, we don't know why he died. And how did he drag himself three miles? Three different papers said that. The coroner made a statement that we don't do autopsies to justify curious people. That was quite a statement. And then he said there must be evidence of death to unnatural causes. What kind of more evidence do you need, you fool? This young man died in the middle of nowhere. You think he died of a heart attack? Well, you won't know until you do an autopsy. And this started a talk in Oregon that really changed the face of search and rescue. This was the case, November 26, 1965. So, here's a map. This is the Willowa Mountains. This is the state line, Washington, Oregon, Idaho. The, the state line goes along the Snake River, Oregon, Idaho. This is Riggins. This is Lewiston, Idaho, right here. This is Halfway, Oregon, La Grand. This is where they took the body. But in California, I can only say this about California because I'm not well, well versed in other states. A body has to be attended for there not to be an autopsy. As an example, let's say that you go in and you have open heart surgery and three days later you die. Well, the entire time you're under the care of a doctor and they can they can determine the cause of death without doing an autopsy. It's called an attended death. Now, if the death is unattended, meaning like Ray, you died in the middle of nowhere, then by law, you have to have an autopsy. Now in Oregon, at this time, <laughs> I have no idea what the, what the coroner was thinking. But the coroner did state later on if he would have known what he knew now, he would have done an autopsy. Well, talk started in Oregon about search and rescue organizations. And who's responsible for organizing them? Who makes the decisions? Who finances the effort? These are all questions that differ from state to state.
jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In national parks, depends on the national park who handles the search. Sometimes it's the county sheriff. Sometimes it's the chief ranger determines. Again, not easy answers. Now, if you get a chief ranger at a national park who hasn't done many search and rescues, you're in trouble. Now, let's talk about Ray Barber, the young man who disappeared, 22 years old. Did people see tracks of rays on a windswept ledge? Would he have walked off the cliff? Did Ray drag himself three miles? Okay, I've, I've read a ton, thousands of search and rescue reports, missing people reports. Friends, I've never heard of anybody dragging themselves three miles, ever. How was he missed by helicopters and planes? Why didn't he shoot his gun earlier in the search and rescue? So, you have point of separation, you have weather, and you have an elk hunter. More people disappear elk hunting than any other kind of hunting. How did Ray die? That answer to that question has never been given. Why did somebody claim that he shot himself? I think I know the reason. Almost any kind of head injury bleeds a ton. He had a rifle. I guess maybe somebody thought he shot himself in the head. Why the claim the body was battered? That's interesting wording to me. Battered implies almost that it was beaten up. My question is, did Ray run into something unusual out there? Did he? Did he or someone drag him three miles? Jim Broussard, his partner. I have nothing but good things to say about Jim. He stayed on site, helped with the search. He's from Bend, Oregon. That poor guy had to carry the memory of Ray Barber with him for the rest of his life. Feel sorry for him. That remote area of Northeast Oregon, Southeast Washington, has a ton of missing people. Highly unusual cases. I've written about many of them in my books. Well, friends, we covered one missing persons case at the beginning of this show, and we covered three at the end. Two of these cases are ongoing. John Early in Southern Oregon, and the case in Missing Fisherman in Maine. If you have the inclination in one of those areas, uh, it's been given out that they're asking for help. So get out there and help. In the meantime, you are very much appreciated. And uh, like I said before, I'll start to get more out in the wilderness as the weather permits. And uh, hopefully we'll get into some pretty interesting areas because there are some out here. Scan of the lake. All 